Justice. No, looks no, fine. No, he's okay. He's okay. Okay, so uh, I will continue with the second part of the tutorial. I'm Lee Song from Georgia Tech, and uh, essentially in the first part of the tutorial, um, what Manuel has done is uh, he has introduced to you this continuous time diffusion model, and then he tell you how to actually um, uh, evaluate the likelihood cascade and how to actually estimate the parameter of this continuous time diffusion model from actual cascade data. And then um, he show you uh, a bunch of uh, generalizations to incorporate topic, uh, things like this, and also show you how to put this uh, continuous time diffusion model into a bigger framework of prime processes. And then what I'm going to do in the second part is, is going to take this continuous time diffusion model and then uh, explain to you uh, several examples how we actually use this continuous time diffusion model for our downstream inference task, such as inference maximization and uh, finding the rumor source source localization problem. I'm also going to uh, introduce one example using these point process, especially Hox process, for something we call the activity shaping, okay? Um, so um, I'm going to start with this inference maximization and show you how do we actually uh, do inference maximization in this continuous time diffusion um, model. So um, the problem is something like this. Let me just briefly introduce to you the problem. The, the goal of this problem is to find a set of people or sites in an information diffusion network such that uh, um, this uh, small set of people can generate a huge number of uh, followers, okay? So you want some piece of information to spread. You have to pick the set of people as your source carefully such that uh, you can reach many, many other peoples. So um, it's a, such a problem, okay? With information diffusion network, with a model like that, you'll be able to tackle this type of problem. So essentially, the first thing you need to do for inference maximization is to define uh, a quantity. Now, what does it mean by inference? You want to define a quantity uh, which uh, quantifies the inference. So in this continuous time diffusion network, you can actually quantify the inference, yeah? Using these, uh, uh, using some probabilistons. So essentially, um, for uh, the continuous time diffusion model, the inference can be defined as the expected number of people that can be infected within some time t, okay? So essentially, this notation here, um, the indicator is just checking for each one of these nodes in the information diffusion network, whether it's going to be infected or not. The infection time is smaller than t or not. If it is smaller than t, it's one, otherwise zero. So summation is going to count the number of nodes that is infected before time t. And uh, because you can sample cascade from this generated model, every time the diffusion is going to look slightly different from each other, every time the exact number of infected nodes is going to be different, you're going to take the average. That's going to quantify the inference, okay? So um, if you just exchange this uh, mission and expectation, what you get is some expression like this. You try to compute for each one of these nodes the probability of being infected within time t or something like that, okay? This is a these are just two ways of expressing this inference, uh, two equivalent way of expressing the inference uh, under this uh, 
probabilistic model. <coughs> so what you want to do is to pick the set of node A as your sources, such that this quantity is going to be maximized, okay? I just pick, uh, okay. <laughs> such that quantity is maximized, okay? That's the goal. So um, essentially, you try to solve the optimization problem like this. So you use this particular definition of inference, right? Where natural, the, the expected number of people that is going to be infected within some time t. You try to find a set of A, uh, which uh, the size of A is constrained by K. Yeah, it's a combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, you try to maximize this objective function. In general, it's a difficult optimization problem. So you need to try all possible combination of uh, size K. Uh, it's going to be um, exponential in K, yeah? But uh, what you can show is uh, something very similar to the discrete time cases. For this continuous time diffusion model, this inference function you defined is going to have some very special property. It's uh, going to be this submodular property. Essentially, you can show that uh, this uh, inference function with respect to a set A, it's similar to um, a cover, kind of set cover problem. Okay, so essentially each one of these information sources, when it starts to spread information, it's going to cover a set of nodes in your, in your network. So each one of these sources is going to cover a subset. So the entire set of sources is going to cover, you know, the union of all these, okay? So you can show that the, these two problems are equivalent. So, um, and then um, the objective function has this submodular property that's nice. Um, we know that for submodular optimization problem, there's a greedy algorithm uh, which can achieve a very good uh, solution. Essentially, the solution you can achieve with a greedy algorithm is uh, going to be 60, at least 63% of the global optimum. So uh, the greedy algorithm is going to start with uh, picking a single node as your source, which gives you the largest inference you're going to evaluate the inference of all these individual nodes and pick the largest one in the first iteration. Once you have uh, pick uh, k minus one uh, node as your sources, you're going to pick the next one, okay? You're going to pick the next node such that the marginal uh, game is going to be uh, the largest. So you're going to look at the uh, inference of a k minus one and also a k minus one unit to get at the node you're going to pick. Um, and you're gonna pick the one with the largest gain, largest difference, okay? So in order to do this maximization, what you will see is that you need to be able to evaluate the inference of each individual nodes, yeah? If your, your network is very large, millions of nodes, you need to do this evaluation. You need to compute this sigma millions of times. Um, and you also need to be able to evaluate, when you add one node, you need to be able to evaluate the subsets of node, their inference. There are many, many evaluations. So the computational complexity of these algorithms actually rely, resides on the computing this inference function, okay? So in this continuous time diffusion uh, model, essentially what we want to do is compute this quantity. When you have information city as a, at the set A, okay, you want to compute this quantity. You want to compute the summation of all these probabilities of a particular node being affected uh, by time t. So with this uh, continuous time diffusion model, actually you can compute these uh, probabilities exactly, okay? So you can turn these problem into a continuous time uh, Markov chain and compute its probability exactly. But somehow this exact computation is uh, very expensive. The computation is actually can be exponential in the size of the network, okay? Uh, only when you have very small network and the network is very sparse, you are able to compute this exactly. But the, the nice thing, we're not going to use this for large scale problem, but we're going to use this uh, exact computation as your benchmark, the test some approximate algorithm, which is really, really scalable. So I'm going to focus on today's to give you some high level idea, okay? Uh, how do you actually design approximate algorithm to compute this inference uh, by um, using this alternative view of this inference, okay? Right. So if you have any question in the middle, just uh, let me know, okay? So um, if we want to compute approximate inference, um, one very simple way you can do it is by sampling, okay? Very simple. You have this probabilistic model, co continuous time diffusion model. You can sample, sample many, many cascades from it. Manu has explained this to you in the first part. And um, uh, one, one way you can approximate this inference, you sample many cascades, and for each one of these cascades, you check the total number of nodes being infected and take the average, okay? And mathematically, uh, 
essentially what you're doing is uh, you're going to sample n sets of transmission times, okay? The cascade is going to correspond to a set of transmission time uh, corresponding to those edges. So this is one sample. G1 is one sample of this transmission time. G2 is a second sample of this transmission time. The number of nodes looks exactly the same. The number of edges looks exactly the same. Just the edge length is going to be different. Sometimes uh, some transmission time between two nodes are longer. Sometimes are shorter. That's why you see this uh, network uh, with different edge lengths. Okay? So you just sample this transmission time. For each one of this network, what you're going to do is um, you do some kind of shortest path uh, computation, right? The infection time is checking the uh, computing the shortest path between the source node and the particular node of interest. And then you just uh, compute the shortest path. Sometimes uh, that node, the shortest path, the distance, is going to be smaller than t. Then you have a counter one. In the uh, second case, the distance may be larger than t, then the count is zero, okay? You do this count for each one is network separately, and you sum them together, average all these uh, ne networks. So remember that, that this computation need to be done for each node as the potential source. Uh, each node can be the potential source. You, you try to select the one which maximizes the inference. You need to try out each one is known as the source of this shortest path algorithm. So uh, in, in overall, if you just consider one of these networks, G1, you want to compute the pairwise shortest path, then the computation is going to be quadratic in the, um, in the number of nodes, yeah? If you don't do anything smart, okay? No problem, right? So essentially, uh, in order to scale out this type of naive sampling approach to millions of uh, nodes, so you have to think about something smart for computing this type of uh, shortest path, okay? Or you have to figure out a way to compute this summation of this indicator function, yeah? Yeah, makes sense? Right. So um, I'm going to first explain the algorithm, and, and then I'm going to explain <laughs> why it makes sense, okay? It's a randomized algorithm. It's difficult to compute pairwise shortest path uh, exactly. Um, using deterministic algorithm, I'm going to use a randomized algorithm to scale it up. So uh, this randomized algorithm is going to take this network, okay? I'm going to just focus on for a particular network. I'm going to generate a set of random uh, numbers according to the exponential distribution. R is distributed as uh, exponential distribution. Um, with just parameter one over there. And then uh, for each one is node, uh, in the network, I'm going to find the smallest label, smallest random number, which is within distance t. Yeah. So uh, any question about the procedure? Okay. So I'm going to sample a set of random number for each one is node. And then um, I'm going to, for instance, find uh, for uh, for this node j, the smallest random number within this t is going to be uh, 0 0.1, okay? Suppose this, this distance is smaller than t. And then, um, and then for uh, node l and k, the smallest node within distance t is going to be 0 0.2, yeah? Smallest uh, label that within distance t is 0 0.2. So essentially, uh, you can carry out this algorithm using something like a breadth-first search, but the reversing the order of the, uh, the edges. You start with node with the smallest random number. For instance, in this case, 0 0.1. You traverse in the backward direction of the edge. If you can reach a node within distance t, then you record that random number in the node. Okay, once you finish, for, for the smallest random number, you move to the second smallest random number do this traversal, okay? So in the end, what you're going to have is, uh, for each node, you're going to recall uh, a random number, okay? It's the smallest random number it can reach within distance t, okay? So you do this for n times. This is another drawer of random number for each one of these nodes. Again, you run this algorithm. In this case, uh, uh, every, every node is going to get its uh, smallest label, 0 0.3. You do it n times. Yeah, each one of these, uh, this algorithm is going to run uh, linear in the number of uh, edge and vertices. So in the end, magically, you can estimate the size of the neighborhood, the number of nodes a particular node can reach by using a formula in the bottom over there. So suppose you draw n sets of random numbers. So the, the size, 
the number of nodes that J can reach, okay, within distance T can be estimated as n minus one over the summation of these uh, smallest random labels. So in this particular case, suppose we just have two uh, sets of random label, then it's going to be two minus one over summation uh, u equal to one to two, and then it's going to be 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3, okay? That's going to be the estimator. So why, why, why this estimator makes sense? Actually, there's a very simple property of this exponential random variable, which enable us to design such a simple algorithm. So the fact is, uh, if you have a set of uh, uh, random variables, which is independent and distributed as the exponential, and uh, if you take the minimum of these n random variables, that minimum is going to be distributed as, again, exponential random variable, but the parameter is going to modify from one to n instead. So the parameter is going to associate, it. it's going to correspond to the number of random variables you're taking a minimum over, okay? If you get one sample from the, for this R star, it will give you one estimate for this n. If you get many, many R star, you will get a good estimate for your m, the size uh, of the, uh, or the number of random variables you're taking the minimum over, okay? So you essentially, this uh, algorithm I showed you in the last slide is applying this idea for estimating the neighborhood of a particular node, right? So you have a node uh, here, you try to estimate the size of node that you can reach within distance t. You're going to generate lots of random labels for these nodes, and then every time you find a minimum label, yeah, that gives you one of these R star. If you do several times, you get several R star and then you apply the formula, maximum likelihood estimation formula, actually that one is, and then you get some estimate of this neighborhood. So, uh, and this algorithm can be done in linear time uh, in a number of uh, nodes and edges. That, that's the trick, okay? So uh, essentially, um, the, um, when you try to do inference maximization, you also try to you know, select the subset of node, not just a single node. You want to also estimate the neighborhood of a set of nodes, okay? And then uh, you want to apply the same trick, essentially you want to find the minimum label which can be reached from this subset of nodes within distance t. So you actually don't need to do any extra computation. Uh, if you want to just compute the neighborhood for a subset, you just, the minimum label or the, for this subset of nodes is just, you're just taking minimum over, uh, you know, this set of nodes computed for individual nodes, okay? So you have already computed the minimum level for individual nodes, and when you are looking at the subset, you are computing a, an additional minimum again, okay? You're just comparing a few numbers, yeah. So it doesn't incur any additional uh, significant computation, okay? So essentially, um, this uh, randomized algorithm gives you a very scalable way of estimating the inference, yeah? And then um, uh, you need to compute this inference many, many times during your inference maximization. With this computation, um, you're able to do millions of nodes, okay? Inference maximization. I'm gonna show some comparison um, between this smarter randomized algorithm and just naive sampling, okay? Computing pairwise is the shortest path. So, but the, before we go into the scalability part, uh, I want to just show you uh, how good uh, is the approximation. So essentially, um, we are experimenting with some small network and um, uh, with different network topology. This network can be either called peripheral network, a random uh, network, Erdős uh, Rennie random graph, or hierarchical network. Uh, it can be generated from this Kronecker uh, uh, graph generator. And then um, uh, you can basically, uh, for this network, you can compute the exact inference for a particular node using the exact formula, uh, using a huge sample, a uh, huge uh, number of cascades and computed pairwise distance exactly, okay? And then um, that's the red curve, okay? That's the red curve. And then we can also use this randomized algorithm to estimate the inference for each individual nodes, and you can compare the two. So essentially, um, these red dots are estimated. Uh, these uh, blue dots are estimated. And then you see a bar here is the variance is very small. And uh, it's giving you very good uh, estimation 
for the uh, exact inference. It doesn't matter uh, what is the network topology, whether it's called peripheral or random network or hierarchical network. You can do these uh, uh, estimation very uh, efficiently, okay? So I didn't show you in the tutorial. Uh, you can actually uh, also obtain some kind of theoretical guarantee of, on how, how, how well you can estimate these inference, yeah? Um, so, but it's giving you very good estimation. So, um, besides accuracy, you also gain in terms of scalability. So, uh, this is uh, some comparison between these efficient randomized algorithm and the naive sampling approach. You know, the NS, this efficient one is this red curve, and then this Infomax is the exact computation. Exact computation. So, uh, for a small network like 128 nodes and 320 edges, and uh, this uh, exact algorithm can still compute uh, the inference, um, but the time needed for the computation is going to be 10 to the 5 okay? uh, seconds. And then uh, this uh, randomized algorithm is going to compute it within uh, 10 seconds. And the knife sampling compute lots of shorted path uh, and needs to like uh, a thousand seconds, something like this. You can also vary the, uh, essentially the, we call network densities, essentially fixing the number of nodes, but you, you, you increase the number of edges, okay? And then um, uh, you can see the continuous, uh, this red curve, which is this randomized algorithm scale nicely with the, the size of the network. And uh, when you move to one million nodes, so it becomes more clear, uh, the only algorithm that can scale to one million nodes is going to be this randomized algorithm. And then this uh, knife sampling approach, which computes pairwise shortest path, uh, and it's quadratic in the size of network, can only compute uh, for uh, around 1,000 uh, nodes, okay? If you go to 10,000 nodes, 100,000 nodes, or, or one million nodes, so the computing time is more than 48 hours. So what we did is we set some kind of uh, upper bound for the computing time. If the program doesn't finish in 48 hours, uh, we're gonna stop it. So uh, you didn't see any curve for this Inframax, yeah, this exact computation, because it's just uh, not even feasible for uh, 100 nodes in this case, okay? Okay, this is about scalability. Um, you have more scalable algorithm, and then you can estimate this inference very accurately uh, that also benefits you in terms of the uh, um, maximizing the inference, okay? You are able to estimate the objective function of this uh, optimization problem very accurately. And um, in the end, you solve this optimization problem using this estimated quantity. You're also getting better solution in the end, okay? So what we did is uh, we used some uh, real data from Manchecker and uh, run this held out experiment. So we are using 80% of the cascade for estimating this diffusion network, the parameter in this diffusion network. Um, many have shown you this convex optimization problem uh, allowing you to estimate the parameter of the diffusion network. Once you have the uh, diffusion network, then you use this randomized algorithm for evaluating the objective function, yeah? And then select the nodes uh, which you think is going to uh, maximize the inference, okay? So once you fix this set of nodes, you are able to evaluate the inference in the held out data set, okay? You're gonna use some 20% uh, of the cascade to see whether this selected node really generate lots of inference, okay? That's the way you evaluate this, uh, whether it has any effects in future, okay? So uh, what, we, what we look at is, uh, the first thing is uh, uh, whether the inference you estimate in this held out data set is more accurate. So uh, this is comparing the actual inference to the, um, to the estimated inference. So these uh, randomized algorithms is going to get smaller error comparing to some method based on uh, feeding discrete time uh, uh, information diffusion model and computing the inference. And uh, in terms of inference maximization, that's the figure B and C, uh, you will see that the actually this continuous time model can give you a higher inference. The node you selected is actually more uh, useful in terms of maximizing the inference, okay? So essentially, that, that's uh, what you're gonna see in practice, okay? Yeah, any question about this application? No? Yeah, very simple. So this is one example uh, where you can use this continuous time diffusion model for. So you can use it for 
maximizing the inference, right? Suppose you're an advertiser, you want to uh, pick a few people to send out free samples. Yeah, hopefully uh, the information can diffuse to more people. Um, you can choose these people using this algorithm. Yeah, you get better uh, overall inference. So um, this is one e example that you can apply this continuous time diffusion model. There's a second example I'm gonna talk about is uh, the source localization problem. So uh, very often when you collect this cascade data from uh, real world, you will find that uh, you cannot get a complete cascade. You only get part of it, yeah? And then w in some cases, uh, if the cascade is about some rumor, so what you will find that the source of the rumor is gone, you only see those people that is infected by the rumor, okay? So what you really want to find out is who is actually the source, who is the, uh, you know, the guy which initiated the, the rumor, yeah? So you can actually do, uh, solve this problem using this continuous time uh, diffusion model. So essentially, uh, if you abstract this problem away, it's something like this. You have a, a diffusion network, yeah? Continuous time diffusion model. And then um, um, you have basically this uh, uh, directed graph, and each one is edges is going to be associated with uh, some kind of transmission function, right? And then uh, you observe a particular cascade starting from some source. But now someone is going to hide away some nodes, some uh, infected node. You don't know whether this node is infected or not. Okay, you only get to observe incomplete cascades. And then the question is, uh, can you figure out the source node based on this uh, diffusion network, yeah, and the incomplete cascade? Can you do that? Um, you can actually do it just within the framework of continuous time model, yeah? So essentially, uh, the way you formulate this problem is uh, in the first part, many have explained to you how do you actually uh, evaluate the likelihood of a complete cascade. If you observe everything in the cascade, you'll be able to write out the likelihood of the cascade, yeah? And uh, it's going to a bunch of product terms. Here you assume that uh, you have uh, both, er everything observed. That's why I write uh, I, this node I is going to be uh, in both the observed one and hidden ones. Suppose you observe everything. So you'll be able to write out a complete likelihood of the cascade. Now you only have observed part of this nodes, there's some variable that is hidden to you, right? So how do you evaluate the likelihood? The way you evaluate the likelihood in that case is just um, like EN algorithm. It's somehow the uh, latent variables, yeah? The likelihood of a partial cascade is going to be uh, related to that complete likelihood. The only difference is that you somehow integrate out the nodes that you don't get observed the information, right? So that the integration essentially does the marginalization, marginalize out. So now you have a way uh, to evaluate the partial likelihood or the, or the likelihood of the partial cascade, incomplete cascade. And then um, just like Ian algorithm, you can find the parameter by ma maximizing the partial likelihood. Here you can also find the node TS, the node and the time of the source that maximize this partial likelihood. Yeah, it's just maximum likelihood uh, framework. The nice thing about this continuous time framework is it gives you uh, a way to evaluate the likelihood of the cascade, partial cascade. You can use it for maximization, do many different things. This is a second example. You can make use of this continuous time diffusion network. So essentially, um, using this continuous time diffusion network, the way you solve this uh, source identification problem is first you're gonna feed these a continuous time model. Find out the parameter of this continuous time model. Once you have find out the continuous time model, giving you a new incomplete cascade or partial cascade, you'll be able to write out the uh, partial likelihood, right? And uh, finding out the source essentially is equivalent to solve another optimization problem. You try to find over these nodes in the hidden sets. You try to find a node in these hidden sets. You also try to find the time, the, the time of this node which maximize the observed uh, partial likelihood. Yeah. This is how you can formulate this problem. Yeah. So essentially you use the same uh, model, you can, you can formulate this problem. So of course um, uh, there's going to be some difficult computational problems associated with it. So you need to leverage some knowledge from um, 
uh, sampling and optimization to solve this more efficiently. So in particular, um, in this particular source localization problem, the computational difficulty is going to come in, in two parts. The first part is when you try to evaluate the partial likelihood. So you need to sum out all these hidden variables. The hidden variable is the infection time of the some, some nodes you don't get observed. It's a continuous variable. If you have many, many unobserved nodes, it's going to be high dimensional integration problem. You need to integrate out all these continuous random variables. That's difficult. The second thing is um, um, when you try to maximize with respect to TS time of this node S, it's a continuous variable. And the objective function with respect to TS is not going to be a simple convex function. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it can be a, a problem which with multiple local optima. Yeah, it's not easy to solve. Um, we're going to make use of some structure of this problem to, to solve it. Okay. So I essentially, uh, that's the key message I want to send, is uh, using this continuous time diffusion model, you'll be able to formulate a problem. In terms of solving this problem uh, by tackling these technical challenges, um, one way to tackle this high dimension integration problem is while sampling again. So in this particular case, you can design some uh, important sampling scheme to evaluate this partial likelihood uh, approximately, okay? So uh, the difficulty of sampling in this particular case is because uh, some nodes are observed, and we have to sample those cascade that which are consistent with this observed node. That makes it difficult. So in order to tackle this challenge, we're actually going to introduce some kind of auxiliary variables, one for each one of these observed nodes, such that sampling is going to be easy. So we introduce these uh, auxiliary distributions, one for each one of these observed nodes, and then um, um, after that, we are going to have some important sampler, okay? Sampling from a different distribution Q, and then um, you're going to uh, sample a bunch of sample from this Q, and then uh, evaluate the ratio between this, this guy and this guy, and then do an average with respect to the sample, yeah? So uh, the detail of this is uh, slightly too complicated to explain in this tutorial. But the idea is uh, to tackle this high dimensional integration problem using important sampling. So once you do that, uh, you will get some simplified expression, uh, although it still looks very complicated in the next slides, okay? Um, it's uh, involving much fewer terms, um, but the nice thing is uh, based on this simplified uh, expression, uh, you, you will actually be able to find out that uh, it's piecewise uh, continuous function of T and you'll be able to actually figure out the, the change points for these pieces based on this continuous time model. And then you maximize within each piece just using some um, search algorithm, yeah. So, um, so this is basically uh, the inference maximization. And then uh, if you are you know, a graph algorithm guy, you can have some idea how to sp speed up this algorithm or scale out this algorithm. You are optimization people, you can also have some ideas which you can contribute, yeah. So um, the next thing is uh, we're going to evaluate this approach for actually uh, uh, data, okay? The first thing is uh, we're going to generate some synthetic data. We're going to first, again, generate some network from this, uh, using this Kronecker uh, network package. And uh, we need a diffusion model, right? So in practice, when you have real data, you're learning from uh, your data. When you have a synthetic experiment, you can actually pre-assign these random diffusion parameters, okay? You assign edge transmission rate uniformly at random, and you can simulate lots of cascades, yeah. So we are going to focus on those cascades, which is pr relatively large, can, you know, it's going to cover more nodes. And then what we are going to do is we're going to hide away many of these nodes. Well, for each particular source, we're going to generate several sets of cascades. We are going to hide away many, many of these nodes, only, you know, let you observe 10% of these nodes in, the, in one cascade. 90% of these nodes is hidden. So now I ask you to find out the actual source. Yeah. And then you can apply these optimization problem I just explained a few slides back. And um, you can, there are some work in the uh, literature trying to tackle this very challenging problem. So uh, there are also some heuristic you can think about to tackle this problem. One very simple heuristic is to, you know, uh, using the degree of the node, uh, choose the node with highest degree as your source, things like this, okay? Or uh, um, using some kind of uh, um, discrete time diffusion model for this problem, yeah? And then uh, in here, what I'm showing is um, 
as you increase the number of cascade, okay, so you can observe the cascade from the same source node many, many times, yeah. Each one of these cascades is incomplete. So you, want, you can a actually aggregate them by just product together likelihood, trying to find a source node. As you increase the number of cascades you observed, or, although none of them are complete, you will actually increase the success probability, okay? So uh, the first panel is showing you the successful probability if you just find uh, the most likely uh, source location, yeah? And if I allow you to find the top 10 most likely uh, solution, the successful probability can be drastically boosted, okay? So when you are uh, allowed to find uh, only the top one most likely known as your source, the successful probability is going to be something like 0 0.2 with one cascade. When you have 10 cascades, the successful probability is more than uh, half of the time, right? 50%. So when you are allowed to predict 10 possible source locations, and then you are given 10 cascades, then the successful probability for this continuous time model can reach one, yeah? For some of these alternative algorithms, uh, either based on heuristic, and it's very hard for them, yeah? Essentially, they are close to random guessing, yeah? Okay. So this is for uh, early running random graph, and if you change to a different type of network, in this case, is a core peripheral network. So this type of network has a densely connected core of people, and uh, many, many other people are connected to this uh, densely connected core. And uh, it's a harder problem because uh, the, the nodes in the, in the center, they're highly connected. It's very hard to distinguish which one is the source. So that's why in this case, when you only observe one partial cascade, for all these algorithms, it's very difficult to distinguish which one is the source. But when you observe 10 nodes, 10 cascades, the successful probability, again, is boosted a lot, close to 0 0.5 for this continuous time model, especially when you look at the top 10 most likely the source node. Then uh, the successful probability for this continuous time model can be as high as 0 0.8, yeah? So it's like uh, you do this experiment many, many times, and 80% of the time, uh, this continuous time model, based on this maximum likelihood formulation, can find the exact uh, source location within 10 guesses, okay? Right. So you, this uh, evaluation using the synthetic data, you can also do it with real data. So we managed to uh, obtain some data from Manchaka, and uh, it's uh, basically uh, some blocks uh, connected, uh, uh, involving 1,700 media sites and then we have uh, the post from all these uh, blocks, okay? And then uh, based on these, uh, these uh, cascades from these kind of uh, real-world data, we can first estimate the diffusion network. Man Manuel has mentioned uh, in the first uh, part of the tutorial. And then uh, we are going to look at some of these bigger cascades in this uh, diffusion network, yeah? And then uh, we're going to, again, hide away 90% of the nodes in the cascade. And just, uh, you know, let the algorithm absorb 10% of the cascade. And let it guess what is the source, yeah? And see whether it's going to recover the source. Again, we can, we can plot the result in the same fashion as we did in the synthetic data. Essentially, you can look at the, when you increase the number of cascades, what is the successful probability if you are allowed to guess one? And what is successful probability if you are allowed to guess 10, okay, locations? So uh, it's in real data, it's uh, even more complicated. So this is a problem in uh, 1,700 sites. And um, if you only allow to guess one uh, nose as your source, so before you have eight or nine cascades, r really you, you, you can't guess anything. The probability is really low. Uh, only after you can observe more than 10 cascades, you start to guess something reasonable. And then uh, if you're allowed to guess top 10 uh, sites as your sources. Um, and if you observe 10 cascades, you will have some probability, sometimes it can be as high as 0 0.1, 10% of the time. You're guessing correctly, yeah? So it's a really hard problem. And um, both, I believe the data are available in our website, and you can also try it using your favorite algorithm, yeah. Okay, so any other question about this? 
So this is the, yeah. Yeah. So these nodes, each of them is stars. Yeah. But uh, any other nodes uh, in this country can find it? Uh, if uh, there are multiple sources, you are saying? Or? Uh, other, not source, mm -hmm. but the other, uh, among the categories. I see. That's a harder problem. We, we didn't think about that. <laughs> so you're saying that uh, not just the source node, but also some other uh, hidden nodes yes. involved in the cascade. So, um, you can, in principle, uh, still use the maximum likelihood approach to include some other nodes, but uh, I can imagine in that case the computation will be difficult because you're not just finding one node. You cannot no longer search for an individual node which maximize. You have this subset problem you need to choose, right? You need to choose from a subset uh, which maximize the, the likelihood. That's much more difficult, the computation problem. In this case, the difference in this case is the objective function is no longer submodular. Yeah, you don't have a guarantee that greedy algorithm is going to give you something good. Yeah, yeah. So if you have any plot where you plot against the amount of vi uh, visible of the cascade, so I assume if you know mm -hmm. 99% yeah. of the cascade, you pretty much know the source. This is only 10%. Right, that's right. So, so. Yeah, right, right. Well, if, if I have, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 70% of the cascade, then the problem is easy, or maybe the, the algorithm is working. Mm -hmm. But here, probably, the, the, the you said that 90% of the cascade is not visible. So yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And I, I didn't show it uh, in the tutorial, but uh, actually in the, in the paper uh, in related to this, uh, we have these type of plots. And uh, indeed, as you increase the number of uh, observed nodes, the successful probability just increases. And it also depends a little bit on the network, type of network you have. The effect is going to be slightly different. Yeah. If you're interested, uh, I, I, can, I can show you the, the reference later on. Yeah. Any other question about this? Mm-hmm. Uh, this we didn't try. I can imagine in that case it's also easier because uh, that uh, early stage, the nose, in fact, is going to get closer to the actual source. And then that probably help you identify the source more accurately. Yeah, we, we didn't try that. But uh, if you're able to get this early stage, uh, catch the early stage, uh, in fact, the node, then it's easier for you to identify the source. Either it's a rumor or, or yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, yeah. Okay. Okay, no more question. Um, so, um, so these two applications are just using the simple cascade continuous time diffusion model, many explained. You already see that this continuous time diffusion model, you can, you know, uh, estimate parameter from the data, you can incorporate topic information, you can tolerate time varying uh, diffusion network structure, you can also use it for inference maximizing and source localization. A simple model can allow you to do many things. So once you generalize that continuous time diffusion model to this point process model for uh, user activity, you can do even more. So I'm going to just show you one application of viewing this uh, user activity in this point process model. So this is a relatively new kind of uh, framework or paradigm we call the activity shaping paradigm. Um, allows you to do something more than just inference maximization. So uh, what is uh, this activity shaping problem? So earlier for inference maximization problem, we just tried to pick some nodes, right, uh, to give incentive, and then such that the hopefully uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the information is going to spread as many people as possible, okay? So in that case, uh, inference maximization, usually uh, the incentive to each people are fixed. And then the inference is basically measured as either these people adopt the idea or not, okay, like the, uh, like the particular product or not. But in real uh, uh, you know, social network, you will just see people generate multiple activities, right? They can recurrently tweet about something and they might trigger the activity in other user, things like this, right? You want to measure this type of inference, the overall activity of the network, not just uh, a once adoption, okay? 
And then sometimes you can give different incentives to different people. Uh, you can ask one people to tweet uh, twice a day, another guy to tweet three times a day, okay? How do you actually distribute this type of incentive to different nodes, yeah? So um, you can actually formulate this type of problem using activity shaping. So in order to do that, actually you need to look at two type of activities uh, in this diffusion network. One type of activity we call the exogenous activity. Essentially some new information coming from outside the network or some kind of a drive from outside of the network. For instance, Facebook gives you some money and asks you to tweet about something, okay? <laughs> to say something good, okay, about something. So for instance, in this particular case example, uh, the external drive exogenous activity is a piece of uh, job advertisement uh, occurring in this social network, right? And then we are also going to uh, look at the endogenous activity, activity internal of the network. Because your neighbor says something, uh, it triggers you to, to respond to it, okay? Some kind of retweeting, yeah? So uh, essentially, uh, we, what we want to do is we are going to, uh, how do we actually choose these ex external activities? such that, that we can generate uh, as large as possible uh, overall activity, something like this. So um, earlier many have explained to you uh, how do we actually model this type of uh, social activity. Um, so using this intensity function or conditional intensity function. So this conditional intensity function, which is a generalization for the uh, rate, okay, or transmission rate, it's going to consist of two parts. One part is going to be this uh, exogenous activity. Another part is going to model this uh, endogenous activity as some kind of self-excitation process, okay? So the overall activity is going to sum together this uh, external drive uh, driven activity and also these uh, internal activities, okay? So the activity shaping, so this, this one I'm, I'm showing here is for each node, you have an intensity function, right? You also model the interaction between the people. Essentially, you have a, a vector of these uh, incentives applied to each one of these person. And then you also have intensity function, a vector of intensity function uh, for uh, all these nodes in the network. So essentially, uh, in this activity shaping, we want the uh, expected activity to achieve some particular goal, either maximizing or some other objective function I'm gonna talk about, okay? So you wanna expect it intensity to, um, to be something, okay? So in order to uh, tackle this problem, the first thing is, uh, uh, suppose I allows you to uh, manipulate these external drives, incentives. So you need a way to link this external activity to these overall activity, okay, expect the overall activity. You need to link them together. How do we actually relate them, yeah? So is there any, any relationship, or is it simple uh, to relate the external incentive to the uh, average uh, overall activity? So it turns out that uh, based on this uh, Hox process model, continuous time type of formulation, you will actually be able to derive a closed form relationship between these external uh, activity and then the expected overall activity. They are related in a linear fashion. So essentially, uh, this, um, uh, this, this is a matrix phi here, which is going to vary over time. This matrix phi is related to this uh, inference matrix, this network structure, how people are influencing each other, and then also this kernel function uh, used in this Hox process. And then you just convolve this matrix with this vector of external uh, incentives, okay? So the, the exact form of this phi is uh, involving some matrix exponential. So essentially, if you pick this uh, kernel to be uh, E to the minus omega T, then this phi matrix is going to be E exponentiated A minus omega times T matrix and then you also have some kind of matrix inversion there, A minus omega I inversion, and times these uh, matrix exponential again. So essentially, uh, this is exactly the fine uh, I showed you in the last slides. If you um, set this external drive to be constant, suppose you uh, have this incentive that you tweet twice a day, okay? It's a constant over time. Then this expression can be further simplified to just matrix vector multiplication instead of convolution. If you have uh, incentive which will write over time, for instance, you tweet twice a day um, today and three times a day tomorrow, four times a day 
um, uh, the, the day after tomorrow, then you need to use convolution. But if you set it to a constant, then it's just related in a linear fashion. It's just a matrix multiplied by a uh, vector, okay? So the, uh, essentially, if we focus on that simple case, um, the overall, the average overall activity is going to relate it to this uh, external incentive in just by a matrix pi times some kind of vector, okay? So we will be able to actually formulate this activity shaping problem uh, in terms of some optimization problem again, okay? So what is this optimization problem? First thing is uh, we uh, add a constraint that uh, this uh, average overall activity mu t is related to this uh, incentive lambda via this linear relationship, okay? And then we also, the objective is to maximize some kind of utility function of the overall activity, yeah? It's either sum of the overall activity or some other quantity. I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, in this case, each person, so the lambda zero is going to be a vector. So each dimension is going to correspond to one node in this social network. And then to incentivize different people, you have different cost. You can also associate cost uh, vector to each one of these nodes. And then you have a total budget. You can also take into all these constraints, linear constraints. And as long as this utility function it's going to be concave in this mu t vector. So it's, a, it's an easy problem. You can solve it and get a global optimum, yeah? So some specific examples of these activity shaping framework is going to be one is just maximizing the aggregated activity across the entire network. You sum over all the nodes in the network. So the alpha is there just because sometimes there's an over information uh, limit, okay? So you cannot maximize the activity of one person to infinite, okay? There's an alpha, upper bound there. You cannot uh, exceed that. That's just taking into account that. But uh, essentially, objective function is just sum together all the activity of the user. It's still a concave function of this mu and uh, subject to linear constraints and inequalities. So you can solve it uh, to get a global optimum of this problem, yeah? So sometimes uh, some users are really inactive in the network. And then you want to even maximize uh, the activity of the, the least active user, okay? So some statistics show that, uh, you know, for this social network, actually only there's 1% most active users generated revenue, okay? If you can mobilize uh, the remaining 99% of the users to be active, uh, then uh, you can drastically boost the revenue in this so social network. So you try to, in this case, uh, maximize the minimum uh, the node with minimum activity, okay? So uh, it's still a concave function of this uh, average activity of each node. And it's still an uh, easy problem to solve. Uh, in theory, it's an uh, uh, optimization. If you look further into this optimization problem, what you will find is, uh, uh, this is a, a yet another example we call the least square activity shaping. So in the earlier two one is either maximizing the average activity or uh, maximizing the smallest activity. And in this particular case, suppose you want the activity of the network to achieve a particular target, V, okay? So this guy has to tweet two times a day and the other guy tweet three times a day, okay? Uh, you want to achieve a target, V, yeah? You can also formulate this problem uh, by you know, just essentially comparing your uh, activity, mu, yeah? to the target, okay, you try to minimize the, the difference. So, and then put a negative there, okay? That's why you maximize it. So you, this is still a concave function of the U, and then essentially you're solving exactly the same optimization problem, okay? So suppose uh, this V is this red curve, you really want your, uh, you know, activity, these uh, blue ones, to look like that, yeah? This is the problem you can formulate in this framework as well. You can think of many other uh, possible utility function that makes sense in practice. And uh, it's still the same problem you, you solve here. And then you can get a global optimal. That's very important. So uh, in terms of actually solving this uh, optimization problem, uh, if you like optimization, there's a room for you to play, okay? So what we have experiment is just very simple optimization approach. We are going to just going to use some kind of a gradient descent, okay? With respect to these constraints, we, we do some kind of projected gradient. We make a move in the parameter. If the parameter is lying outside of this constraint space, we just project it back. Okay, there's an efficient way to do it in this case. Um, and uh, what you will find is uh, in the algorithm, when you try to compute a gradient, you need to evaluate this quantity, yeah, this psi function, which involves exponentiating matrix A and inverting this matrix A. 
If your A matrix is big, you have a social network of millions or billions of nodes. So again, this is a commutation intensive problem, yeah? You have to make use of some linear algebra, uh, numerical linear algebra approach to speed up this computation for a matrix exponential and also matrix inversion, yeah. If you're numerical people, then uh, there's also room for you to improve this further. Um, uh, in particular, in this case, uh, when we run projected gradient, what you will find is in the problem structure is you don't need to um, compute this matrix exponential explicitly. What you need to do is to be able to compute this matrix times a vector, yeah, okay? So when you try to do compute the matrix times a vector, so there's many, many terms of a, a numerical linear algebra approach you can use to speed it up, okay? So in general, this type of method falls into the, the class of uh, method called a Krilov space method, okay? You can use it to speed up its computation. And um, uh, both for uh, these uh, matrix exponential times V, and then when you try to solve for this matrix inversion problem, you just solve a linear system instead of uh, doing the matrix inversion explicitly. So uh, you just use two pieces of uh, tricks for numerical linear algebra uh, to scale it up. I'm going to show you the, the later sense experiment. By you know, using this uh, trick, you can speed up your algorithm tremendously. So what we have done in experiment is uh, we can, again, use some real world data to, to conduct experiments. For instance, uh, there's some uh, URL service, shortening service, that is being by used by Twitter user. We can crawl this type of data and uh, model the uh, usage of this URL shortening service using Hawks process, yeah? And see whether this activity shaping framework can, can help you uh, either increase the overall usage of this URL shortening service or boost the, um, the minimum usage, okay? Yeah? So um, what we have collected is uh, the Twitter data from 2,000 users and another network of 50,000 users. The 2,000 user uh, data is going to be used for uh, evaluating the, you know, how effective this uh, activity shaping is going to be. And a 50K is going to use for evaluating the uh, scalability of this uh, algorithm. So uh, the data is collected over a uh, month of period of time. In order to use this framework, we had to first uh, feed this diffusion model, right? This Hox process model to the data. Once we uh, feed this uh, Hox process model to the data, we can essentially run many activity shaping tasks by solving this optimization problem and changing different type of uh, objective function. So once you, well, once you uh, finish uh, solving this uh, optimization problem, you get different uh, incentives, okay? You can evaluate uh, how effective are uh, these, uh, you know, um, uh, incentives using either uh, theoretical, theoretical kind of uh, objective you calculated using the formula, or you can actually simulate this activity for your model and see whether this objective is similar to the simulated objective. And you can also use a uh, health data set to compute it. Of course, the best evaluation will be you actually go to Twitter and deploy this algorithm and uh, wait for a month and see whether your activity shaping is actually different from you know, some random kind of uh, random algorithms, okay? So uh, uh, let me just talk a little bit about this uh, held out evaluation. So we have already crawled eight months of data, right? So we are going to basically divide this data into uh, 50 different epochs. And uh, each one is proc uh, consists of data for five days. So we're going to feed this Hox process model to each one of these epochs. So we get 15 different models. Each model has its own uh, lambda zero and then its uh, corresponding uh, expected overall yeah, activity, okay? So we are going to take the one of these epoch and run the activity shaping. So it's going to tell you that the, uh, how should I change my, my, my incentive in order to achieve some uh, maximum activity or something like this, okay? So then you will be able to uh, compare uh, these uh, base intensity incentive uh, obtained you by your optimization algorithm to, to all these uh, base intensity from other epochs. You will also be able to compare the uh, achieved level of activity to the level of activity in other different yeah, epochs. So you will get two rankings. Yeah? You essentially, you will get two rankings. So you will get some kind of a distance 
between the activity in this epoch and other epoch, you will get distance between these uh, base intensity or incentive to the base intensity in other epochs. You get two distance. So if your algorithm is um, having some effects, these two rankings should be close. So you can measure these uh, by rank correlation. Okay? It's uh, slightly more complicated held out scheme to, to test whether this uh, uh, activity shaping has some effect or not. Okay? So if you do this, uh, you can basically uh, evaluate to some extent uh, the effectiveness of this activity shaping in real data. And uh, the first two panel is going to be uh, evaluated using the uh, theoretical objective means that they're just using this linear relationship between these uh, phi matrix, uh, this uh, average ex uh, expected activity, and then the baseline intensity, okay? And then similarly one, you can simulate additional uh, events based on the model and see whether your um, algorithm is giving you something that with a better objective. So for the held out one, uh, in this case, uh, using that uh, scheme I explained in the last slide, if the rank correlation is high, ideally it should be one, then it's a better algorithm. So in this case, uh, the first bar, the blue bar, is going to be this uh, algorithm uh, provided by this activity shaping framework. And then the other algorithm are just common heuristics, for instance, using pick the highest degree, and then pick the node with the highest between essentiality, things like this, to um, trying to maximize the activity. So what you will find is uh, this uh, approach-based convex optimization, activity shaping framework, is g giving much better results, okay? So in particular, um, we can show that uh, you have actually 10% more events than the second best, okay? If you uh, translate it back to this uh, 1,700 node network, it's like 34,000 more events per month uh, than the second best, okay? Lots of events. So this is uh, another uh, setting when you just look at the um, node with minimum activity, okay? You just try to see whether the node with minimum activity, the activity is going to be boosted or not. So in this case, um, um, the held out scheme, this uh, algorithm uh, provided by this activity shaping framework, convex optimization, uh, is again better. The start there just denotes the statistical significant so uh, uh, what it translates to the uh, real world setting is uh, um, you can make those less active users two times, generally two times more events, okay, than the second best, right? So any, any other question about this setting? Okay. So in terms of scalability of the algorithm, remember that the, the, the bottom there is computing these uh, matrix exponential for um, you know, thousands of nodes or tens of thousands of nodes or millions of nodes, and then computing this matrix inversion needed for the, the gradient step. Y if you use this trick I, I explained to you, Krilov space method for computing matrix times vector product, Krilov, uh, and then solving this linear system. So essentially, if you, even you have uh, 10K users, the runtime is really fast, yeah, for these, uh, this algorithm. If you don't uh, use this uh, linear algebra approach and then compute the matrix exponential and matrix inversion explicitly, then the runtime looks like a quadratic in the number of nodes. When you go to 10K nodes, essentially you cannot compute it. Again, we set some upper bound. If it doesn't finish, and uh, we stop it. This is extrapolated time. Yeah. 10K users, uh, if you go to more users, 50K, yeah, and then um, uh, these, uh, this uh, explicit computation approach is uh, is just n infeasible, essentially, right? Okay. So uh, this is the three example I want to talk about. Essentially, give you some kind of uh, additional example. How do you actually use this uh, continuous time diffusion model and the more general point process wheel for tackling some problem in social network? And how do you model social activity? and then, um, you know, make some inference on this social activity. So, um, but uh, the application is not just limited to these three. Once you have this continuous time diffusion model and point process network model, you can actually tackle many, many problems. So if you look at the many of these data collected uh, in some social platform, it always it's always some kind of discrete events 
uh, has a time temporal time step attached to it. Yeah, has a time step attached to it. For instance, if you look at some of these uh, uh, internet self financing website, Kiver or some other places, so you you can see the transaction. This transaction happened at this time, right, between which two people. So you can you can actually figure out which period of time there are more transactions, whether there's any inference between one transaction to other transaction. So uh, not just uh, you know rumor in the social network. If you have real disease spreading in, in social network, you can also use this type of approach to do it. For instance, Google Fruit Chain and the Center of Disease Control they're all interested in this type of problem. Um, in that case, actually there's an even more interesting component in that. It's the spatial information. You have a temporal time step and spatial uh, location, yeah? And then you can actually generalize this uh, temporal point process to spatial temporal point processes, yeah. So uh, another aspect I didn't get to touch upon is, uh, so because this event happened in time, and then you observe it many times, there may be some uh, t causality, causal issues, yeah, which you might be interested in, which event is causing the other events. So in, in time series analysis, there's this granular causality type of notion. You can also generalize that causality notion to this continuous time discrete event setting. Yeah, there are also many interesting things in it. Um, there's uh, endless um, application you can apply this type of framework to, but uh, another interesting aspect of this uh, continuous time diffusion network aspect is you'll be able to uh, you know leverage lots of other theories and algorithm uh, frameworks developing in different places. For instance, you can. Uh, leverage some machine learning techniques, sampling approach, maximum likelihood approach. You can also leverage lots of algorithms, randomized algorithms for large scale network for this problem. Yeah. So uh, the application, of course, touch upon not just uh, information diffusion network. Um, it touches upon even biological networks and uh, maybe power grid. Yeah. And other other computational biology problems. Okay. With this, uh, I'd like to uh, end the tutorial. A any other questions? Yeah. Or if you're interested, you can just come to me after afterward. Okay. No more? Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah.